Yo, yo, yo. Welcome to Breaking the Set. I'm Abby Martin. So recently, this show has been grabbing the attention of some pretty interesting people, like David Frum. Remember the childlike axes of evil speech delivered by George W. Bush in 2002? Well, you can thank Frum for that, as well as multiple other dumbed-down speeches W. gave during that time. In case you're still wondering, good old Frum has never stopped spewing propaganda. In fact, he proudly stands by the axes of evil fear-mongering he was pushing while working for the White House. Yes, Frum is considered relevant somehow, enough to be given a platform at the Atlantic and the Daily Beast. But I guess what else can you expect from a website that hires neocon tools like Eli Lake and James Kerchick to spew the talking points from the warmongering think tanks they represent? Just take a look at this tweet from D. Frum, where he posts the report I did about his buddies at the neocon think tank Foreign Policy Initiative. He says not to confirm RT conspiracy theories, but neocon gay Jew James Kerchick arriving in Kiev tonight. Wow, I have no idea why he decided to use gay and Jewish as a pejorative, but thank you for watching my show. Here's a question. Why the hell are professional trolls Tweedledee and Tweedlefrum in Kiev in the first place? I guess we'll stay tuned for the exclusive on that one. Now let's break the set. It was a terrible mistake, and we're working very hard to make it up for it. Once again, we put something on the air. It's a flat-out lie. Have you ever had sex with Governor Rick Perry? No, wait. Do not answer that. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. Social media has become an increasingly important tool for organizing and communicating in the midst of political turmoil. So when a government makes moves to restrict its citizens' access to social media or even bans websites altogether, you would think that the rest of the world's establishment media would ask why, but not in the case of Turkey. See, the Erdogan regime in the country first shut down Twitter about a week ago for, quote, spreading false information only days before a significant election was set to take place. Then. Just yesterday, YouTube was officially banned. And of course, the fact that two of the biggest social media sites have been restricted in Turkey has blown up across the global press wire. However, the story gets much crazier than just that. See, the banning of YouTube was actually prompted by a video posted on the site that was allegedly leaked from top Turkish officials. But if you're just getting this story from the MSM, all that was discussed in the tape is a vague reference to Syria. Take a look at this. According to the BBC, the officials are, quote, discussing Syria in the tape, and Fox reported the exact same line. But if you take a look at Reuters, it turns out there's just a teensy bit more to the story, claiming officials are, quote, discussing possible military operations in Syria. The Washington Post wrote a similar story, stating officials were, quote, discussing military intervention in neighboring Syria. But the most distorted interpretation of all came courtesy of the Jerusalem Post, which writes that the tape included discussion of, quote, a possible operation to secure the tomb of Suleiman Shah. Interesting, considering how a simple read of the transcript shows the exact opposite of what J. Post alleges. And as far as the rest of the corporate press, there's a consistent glaring omission of something much more sinister at play here. See, the International Business Times acquired a transcript of the internal meeting. So let's take a look at what these officials really want to do with the tomb of Suleiman Shah, the site in Aleppo, Syria, where the grandfather of the founder of the Ottoman Empire is buried. In the discussion, head of Turkish intelligence, Hakan Fidan, says, quote, I'll send four men from Syria if that's what it takes. I'll make up a cause of war by ordering a missile attack on Turkey. We can also prepare an attack on Suleiman Shah's tomb if necessary. So basically, Turkey's intelligence chief is saying that he's going to make up a false pretext to militarily intervene in Syria by hiring four men to attack his own country. So who are these four men he's talking about? Turkish soldiers? Well, one only has to read a little further to understand exactly who Fidan has in mind, the same group that seems to be fighting all the proxy wars in the Middle East, al-Qaeda. As the undersecretary of the Minister of Foreign Affairs explains, we're going to portray this as al-Qaeda. There's no distress there if it's a matter regarding al-Qaeda. And if it comes to defending Suleiman Shah's tomb, that's a matter of protecting our land. The foreign minister goes on to explain how Prime Minister Erdogan is well aware of the plan, 
saying, quote, Prime Minister said that in current conjecture, this attack on Suleiman Shah tomb must be seen as an opportunity for us. Followed up by the Deputy Chief of Staff saying it's a direct cause of war. I mean, what we're going to do is a direct cause of war. Wow. See, this bombshell leak describes something known as a false flag operation. A false flag is a covert military operation designed to appear as if it were carried out by other parties and is usually used as a pretext for military intervention with the citizens of the country unaware of their government's premeditated actions. See Gulf of Tonkin used to invade Vietnam and the Reichstag fire in Hitler's Germany as a pretext to invade Poland. Now, listen, this phrase, of course, has been hijacked and misapplied to many events. But amazingly, anyone who simply acknowledges proven false flags throughout history is labeled a conspiracy theorist, which is why the mainstream media's refusal to discuss this covert operation should come as no surprise. Because it's much easier to just state that Turkey was discussing Syria than to do their jobs and expose the true intentions of those in power and how far they're willing to go to maintain it. Earlier this week, UN Human Rights Commissioner Navi Pillay made some of the strongest comments we've heard from the organization about Israeli settlements in the West Bank and Gaza. Pillay told the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva that, quote, Israeli settlement-related activities and settler violence are at the core of many violations of human rights in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. And in fact, according to Israel's own statistic bureau, Israeli settlements in the West Bank more than doubled last year and have hit a record 13-year high. So to discuss the continuing construction of these settlements and the future of the Palestinian-Israeli peace process, I'm joined now by Miko Piled, peace activist and author of The General's Son, Journey of an Israeli in Palestine. Thank you so much for coming on. Sure, thank Always you. Always a pleasure to have you on. Pleasure. Can you speak to the validity of Piled's statements here about this being kind of the main um, deterrent in the peace process right now? I think, it's, uh, I think it's an understatement. I think the problem is um, that Israel treats settlements in the West Bank just like she, Israel treats cities and towns all over the rest of the country. Israel doesn't see a difference between the West Bank and other parts of the country. Um, and really, in terms of Israeli thinking and in the terms of you know, psyche, there, you know, the cities in the West Bank, the cities in other parts of the, of, the, of the country are the same. So why not build here when you build here? Israel occupied the West Bank in order to keep it, in order to settle Israeli Jews there. And that's exactly what it's been doing ever since it occupied that piece of land. Um, and, and, and as far as Israel is concerned, it's a part of Israel, and it's not going to change. Mm -hmm. and, and according to Israeli human rights group Beth Salam, three times as many people were killed in the West Bank in 2013 than the year prior. Why this uptick in violence there? Well, in the absence of anything else, Israel has to maintain a certain level of violence in order to justify its, its existence. In other words, peace is not on, the, on Israel's program at all. As we've seen, another round of peace talks has failed, as was, accepted, as was ex expected. Um, and again, Israel has no other plan. It doesn't want peace with the Palestinians. It is not willing to give up any piece of the land. In terms, of, like I said, of Israeli thinking, it's all Israel, so it's not going to change. Um, and if you're not going to solve the problem somehow, then the only way to justify the existence of its, of, of, uh, and its legitimacy is through maintaining the violence. And, and of course, they're, they're continuing to go in and raid and, uh, aggressively these yes. areas that are supposed to be kind of uh, in charge of policing by the Palestinian Authority. Why are they continuing to move in past even what's supposed to be authorized by Palestinian forces to secure their own areas? Well, once again, in terms of, in terms of Israeli thinking, there is no difference between the West Bank and other parts of the country. Israeli military has the right to go anywhere it wants, whenever it wants, and do whatever it likes. And so, uh, and so attacking Palestinians, whether it's resistance, people who are involved with resistors, or whether it's, it's, it's legitimate law enforcement, it makes no difference. It's, in terms of Israeli thinking, there has to be a certain level of violence maintained all the time. And so Israel keeps maintaining that violence in order to justify its, its lack of willingness to make peace and then blaming it on the Palestinians. Is this utter contempt for kind of the law and Palestine in general a reason also that it reneged on its promise to release all these prisoners? I mean, just yesterday, they reneged on its commitment to release another group of Palestinian prisoners tomorrow, which of course is just another 
uh, deterrent of the peace process, I mean, ultimately. Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. I think the prisoners issue is an issue that is not talked about enough. Israel has thousands of political prisoners, Palestinian prisoners. The vast majority have never been charged with acts of violence. These are political prisoners. And Israel use them, uses them very cynically and cruelly as a tool. I think all these things lead to the inevitable conclusion that Israel is the obstacle to peace. And the only way to overcome that would be to do what was done in South Africa and change the regime completely so that we have a real democracy where Israelis and Palestinians live together in peace. As long as Israel is a player in this process, there will never be a solution to this conflict. Well, I guess that you already kind of answered my next question, which is the peace process. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's kind of a, a sham. I mean, even April 29th was the target date for merely coming up with a framework agreement. I mean, is this just... It's a sham. It, I mean, the peace yeah. process is code word almost for allowing Israel to continue to do whatever it likes and in, in, in over the entire country. The peace process cannot possibly work because it's going in the wrong direction. It's going in a direction that assumes that Israel might allow the Palestinians to establish a state in the West Bank and Gaza, and that is, a, that is a false assumption. That will never happen. Israel will never give up any part of the land and will never allow the Palestinians to do this. And again, the last 67 years of the existence of the State of Israel demonstrates that very clearly. Well, so what do we do? Because, of course, the U.S. is such strong allies with Israel, and, of course, Israel is almost treating Palestinians as they're just going to keep moving and moving and encroaching more and more until they're just gone. I mean, it seems like that's the strategy right now, is to just squelch them out completely of the land and pretend like they're not there and they are just have complete contempt for the law and international law. What do we do? I mean, you're saying to transform Israel to incorporate a two-state solution. We both know that that's... No, I'm talking about... Oh, you're talking forgetting, about... Forgetting you're, about you're talking about solution. forgetting the two-state solution. I'm talking about coming to, the finally, coming to the realization that Israel today is exactly what South Africa was before the fall right. of apartheid. The only way to move towards a solution is to rid Palestinians and Israelis of this regime, which is a, which is a, a colonialist, racist regime, which is what Israel is. It's what Zionism is. It's the foundation of the state of Israel. And the only way to move forward or to change the reality on the ground is to fight this regime just like, you know, in the 80s and then before that, people, people fought and opposed uh, apartheid in South Africa. Then we can see the release of prisoners, then we can see uh, respect for human rights, then we can expect a regime that respects everyone because it represents everyone. Until the government in Israel represents everyone, or Palestine and Israel, represents everyone who lives there, then this will continue to be the way it is because Israel governs on its own, even though it represents less than half the population. Mika, talking about even just using the word apartheid is such strong language, and when I say it and people react to me and they, they kind of call me all these uh, pejoratives just because I'm constantly talking about Palestine and Israel and um, in a factual sense, and, and your grandfather was integral in the formation of Israel, your father was an IDF general, what's your response to kind of this toxic reactionary language when you just simply try to bring up pro-Palestinian issues? We have about 45 left. Well, it's interesting. I was just in South Africa, and when you talk to South Africans, the, the, the comparison between Israel and today in South Africa during apartheid is so clear that, it, that it's even funny to bring it up. There is nothing inherently Jewish about the state of Israel, so there's nothing anti-Semitic about criticizing it. Jews have rejected Zionism and rejected Israel from the very beginning. Many Jewish people still do. Um, and the only way to move forward is to realize that Israel today is South Africa before the fall of apartheid and to act accordingly. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Miko Pilet. Always amazing to have you on. Thank you. Coming up, you guys, you'll hear from theoretical physicist and genius Michio Kaku on the future of the mind. Over the past few decades, tremendous advancements have been made in the field of neuroscience, from mapping the human brain to creating devices that can capture digital images of our thoughts. But what if we could upload a digital copy of our memories and consciousness to a point that human beings could actually achieve a sort of digital immortality? This idea has inspired many science fiction movies, including the upcoming film Transcendence, where one man's mind is uploaded into a supercomputer which possesses the collective knowledge of all of humanity. 
While the film is fiction, the concept behind it is very real. It's also the subject of a new book called Future of the Mind, which is currently number one on the New York Times bestseller list. The author is renowned theoretical physicist Michio Kaku. Earlier today, breaking the set producer Manuel Rapolo caught up with Dr. Kaku and first asked him how far we really are from achieving a digital upload of consciousness. Just last year, for the first time in world history, a memory was recorded. We can actually tape record a memory and insert it back into an animal and it remembers. This is amazing. At Wake Forest University, also in Los Angeles, they took a mouse, trained the mouse to sip water, recorded the memory in the hippocampus right here, small organ that processes memory. The mouse later forgot that. Then they shot the memory back into the mouse and bingo, the mouse got it the first try. Next will be primates. Perhaps a monkey eating a banana will record that memory and insert it back in. And the short-term goal is to create a brain pacemaker for Alzheimer's patients. In the future, we're going to have millions of people who forget where they live, wander around. Why not have a button? You push the button, and you immediately remember where you live, who you are, who your kids are. And beyond that, who knows? Maybe we'll upload the vacation that you never had. <laughs> It just, it, it seems so mind-blowing to me to, to consider that, that memory, which is not a static thing, it's always changing, it's evolving depending on our, on our experiences, can be digitized. It just, it's, it's, it's really mind-blowing. But uh, I want to ask you about something else that you mentioned in the book, um, the ability for telepathy. And you've actually said in the past that in the future, humans will be able to mentally contact anybody we want, see whatever image we want, and do, and if we don't like it, we can just turn it off. That's really? Right. In the future, in fact, today we can get uh, so that you walk into a room, we'll put on a headset, such that you can control the lights, turn on the TV, call for your car, tell your car where to go, type, dictate documents without ever touching a computer screen. And our children will wonder, how could you possibly live in a world where you had to touch the screen and you had a mouse and you had to type? Everybody just thinks and types, makes documents, controls cars. It's, it's fascinating where we're headed, and it, and it seems like it really is inevitable. And I think a lot is taken for granted over the things that we're already able to do now. I mean, you were just referring to, to these sensors in the brain that can capture images inside the brain. What are, what are some of the other practical applications that these things could have? Well, this will replace the Internet. It'll become a brain net. <clears throat> we'll record emotions, thoughts, patterns, behavior, and send it on the Internet. Teenagers will love it. Can you imagine Facebook? You send emotions, your first date, your first kiss, your first senior prom, all on the Internet. Teenagers already put little, like, happy faces on their, on their emails, right? We're going to be able to record thoughts, and the movies are going to be replaced by the brain net. Movies today are a flat screen with sound. That's the movies, right? In the future, perhaps emotions and feelings will also be conveyed. This is called total immersion entertainment. That's, it's amazing. And, and, and actually, that reminds me of this, this new movie that's uh, coming out now, this Johnny Depp movie called Transcendence, where it kind of takes that premise as well, you know, uh, taking your consciousness and, and uploading it uh, digitally. Um, but I wanted to ask you, I mean, you make it sound like it's going to be a lot of fun, but it also, there's, there's aspects that I think are a little bit terrifying. And I wanted to ask you about mm -hmm. this, this new pill that's being developed that can slow down a person's perception of, of time. And what's being said is that, you know, this could be applied to prisoners. Uh, and given, they'll take a pill, it'll, it'll slow down uh, the perception of time so that eight, eight uh, hours could feel like a thousand years, a thousand years sentence. How would this work and why does the future sound so terrifying? <laughs> Well, we are tinkering with the brain itself. For example, people who have traumatic memories of war, sometimes they're paralyzed with these horrible memories of a rape, an accident, warfare. We can create a forgetful drug that actually takes the edge of many of our most uh, violent and, and oppressive memories. However, the President's Commission on Bioethics recommended against marketing the forgetful drug because they said that even unpleasant memories are useful. We learn from them. But personally, I think that sometimes some memories are so disastrously awful that they paralyze you. They prevent you from becoming a normal person. And I think we should allow forgetful drugs to be marketed. Also, drugs and therapies which can perhaps even increase intelligence are now being talked about. We'll have perhaps memories that we can upload into the mind, perhaps memories of a job that we're not trained for.
and, or perhaps a college student will upload a course that they flunked in college. We can perhaps increase our intelligence. And now we're also investigating super intelligence, photographic memory. People who memorize everything. They hear a concert, they see a landscape, they can draw the landscape, they can re reproduce the entire concert on one try. How is it possible that people have that mind? We not believe that the mind records, but the mind also forgets deliberately. These people, the forget mechanism is broken. They never forget. They have a photographic memory, and we think that some great scientists of the past had this ability, the ability to have access to powers of the mind that we cannot as mortals. Right, and it, it, and this is nothing new. This is this is something that that you know can date back for, for for a very long time. People that have those photographic memories, and you've actually said that right now, the time that we're living in is the golden age for for learning about the mind. That we've learned more in the last 15 years than in all of prior human history. Why? What took so long? Because only recently have we had the physics, the instruments like the MRI scans that are sensitive enough to see the blood flow of the thinking brain down to like a tenth of a millimeter. And now we have supercomputers that can actually read these thoughts and control computers by thinking. So by thinking, we can now control mechanical arms, mechanical legs, we can type uh, we can control thermostats, turn on the web, turn on, change a channel on a TV set, turn on the toaster, all of it just mentally. And at the next international soccer games in Brazil, scientists at Duke University want to take someone who's totally paralyzed, outfit him with an exoskeleton, and he will introduce the international soccer games in Brazil. That's amazing. Um, and actually, one of those things that I've always enjoyed about your work is you're, you're very gifted in, in taking these complex theories and making them easier, easier to understand. Um, I wanted to ask you about this recent discovery about the gravitational waves that are mm -hmm. essentially remnants of the Big Bang. Can you explain why this is such an amazing discovery? Well, we think that at the instant of the Big Bang, gravity waves, waves that we've never seen before, dominated the Big Bang. And now we see them with our, with our detectors in the South Pole. Einstein predicted this 98 years ago. And it took 98 years for us to see that at the instant of creation, there were, in fact, gravity waves. Now, this is very incredible because it means that the Big Bang was a quantum event, meaning that there's a probability it could happen again and again and again, creating a multiverse of parallel universes. So our universe may not be the only universe. This result has philosophical, theological implications. If the Big Bang happened once, as a quantum event, it can happen again. It's, it's, it's a subject that's so almost impossible for the human mind, <laughs> at least mind, to even fathom. Uh, but you bring up a, a good point, which is another subject that, that's very interesting that you discuss, is God. You, you, um, you describe yourself as a pantheist, and I was hoping that for our viewers that don't know what pantheism means, you could explain that and how that ties into your work in theoretical physics. Well, Einstein was asked the question about God, and he says there are really two kinds of God. First is the personal God, the God that answers your prayers, that smites your enemies in the Philistines. But he didn't believe in that God. He believed in the God of Spinoza, the God of harmony, beauty, simplicity. You know, the universe could have been ugly. It could have been random. It could have been chaotic. And yet, here we are in an orderly universe that obeys very simple laws. You can put all the laws of physics on one sheet of paper. That's simplicity and elegance. And that's the God of Einstein, the God of Spinoza, the God of harmony. And that's the God that I lean toward. That is, the universe itself is so gorgeous, and it didn't have to be that way. I think that's something we could all get behind. Um, I wanna, I'd love to continue to talk about um, God in the universe and everything. Uh, I want to talk about something a little bit more earthly, something a little bit closer to home that you've been outspoken about as well, which is Fukushima and the nuclear crisis in Japan. Um, there's so much disinformation out there. How, what is the severity of the crisis right now as you see it? The crisis is much more severe than we're led to believe. Documents have been coming out over the last two years showing how the utility and the government deliberately suppressed vital information. Did you know that even as the accident was progressing and they said, don't worry, everything's under control, they were contemplating evacuating Tokyo. Evacuating Tokyo. I mean, it's mind boggling, but that's how severe the accident was. Now, right now, we have three melted reactors. It'll take 40 years, by their estimate, 
to clean up this disastrous accident, and it could start again anytime soon. A small earthquake could tip it over, and the accident starts all over again. I mean, that's it, it really is in, insanity, <laughs> nuclear, nuclear insanity, really. Like I said before, though, like, and, and as you mentioned, you know, that sounds like a conservative estimate, 40 years uh, for the cleanup. There's so many conflicting reports that are coming out. The seafood safe to eat. Oh, no, it's not. The radiation is going to hit the West Coast, and other scientists will disagree. What will be the, the long-term impacts? Is this an ever, everlasting crisis? It's not an everlasting crisis, but there are dead zones. Dead zones around the reactor. That'll be dead zones for decades to come. And all of us have a piece of Fukushima in you. I can take a Ganga counter right to your body and detect some of the radiation from the reactor. However, it's minimal. So don't think that everything is going to be radioactive here in the United States. It's not that way. Food you can eat. However, we have to monitor the food very carefully because we do know that radioactive cesium with a half-life of about 30 years leaked into the ocean and it's water soluble and it did get into the fish and sea life around Fukushima. But the government does monitor these things and so far as we know the food supply is safe. Well, I mean it, it I hope so. <laughs> I hope that we can that we can eat this food. And um, I did want to ask you, you know, given that the crisis, uh, like you said, another minor earthquake could could trigger another meltdown, another tipping point. Exactly. Right. And and this, there's so many different reactors all over the world. There's so many here in the United States. Do you think that as a result of Fukushima, you know, what we've learned from Chernobyl? that in the future will eventually do away with nuclear energy. Do you see us moving beyond that? Well, Germany has already thrown in the towel. Germany says N never again. They saw what happened at Fukushima. A disaster in Germany could literally wipe out Germany as, as a nation. And so they're phasing out nuclear entirely. Switzerland follows suit. Italy is sort of teetering right now. And even Japan is teetering on the, on the brink. They have a national debate as to whether or not to go nuclear or not. See, after World War II, Japan made the Faustian bargain. Faust was the legendary figure who sold his soul to the devil for unlimited power. That's the Faustian bargain, bargain that Japan made after the war. And now they're going to have to reanalyze whether it's worth it to sell your soul to the devil. Well, that's the future of nuclear energy, I suppose. Dr. Michio Kaku, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Theoretical physicist, author of The Future of the Mind. It's number one uh, right now. Everybody check it out. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's our show, you guys. Have a great weekend. Join me again next week when I break the set all over again. I guess we'll stay tuned for the exclusive on that one. Now let's break the set. It was a terrible mistake, and we're working very hard to make it up for it. And once again, we put something on the air. It's a flat out lie. Have you ever had sex with Governor Rick Perry? No, it's do not answer that. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. somehow enough to be given a platform at the Atlantic and the Daily Beast but I guess what else can you expect from a website that hires neocon tools like Eli Lake and James Kerchick to spew the talking points from the warmongering think tanks they represent just take a look at this tweet from D from where he posts the report I did about his buddies at the neocon think tank foreign policy initiative he says not to confirm RT conspiracy theories but neocon gay Jew James Kerchick arriving in Kiev tonight Wow, I have no idea why he decided to use gay and Jewish as a pejorative, but thank you for watching my show. Here's a question. Why the hell are professional trolls Tweedledee and Tweedle from in Kiev in the first place? Social media has become an increasingly important tool for organizing and communicating in the midst of political turmoil. So when a government makes moves to restrict its citizens' access to social media or even bans websites altogether, you would think that the rest of the world's establishment media would ask why. 
but not in the case of Turkey. See, the Erdogan regime in the country first shut down Twitter about a week ago for, quote, spreading false information only days before a significant election was set to take place. Then, just yesterday, YouTube was officially banned. And of course, the fact that two of the biggest social media sites have been restricted in Turkey has blown up across the global press wire. However, the story gets much crazier than just that. See, the banning of YouTube was actually prompted by a video posted on the site that was allegedly leaked from top Turkish officials. But if you're just getting this story from the MSM, all that was discussed in the tape is a vague reference to Syria. Take a look at this. According to the BBC, the officials are, quote, discussing Syria in the tape, and Fox reported the exact same line. But if you take a look at Reuters, it turns out... Yo, yo, yo. Welcome to Breaking the Set. I'm Abby Martin. So recently, this show has been grabbing the attention of some pretty interesting people, like David Frum. Remember the childlike axes of evil speech delivered by George W. Bush in 2002? Well, you can thank Frum for that, as well as multiple other dumbed-down speeches W. gave during that time. In case you're still wondering, good old Frum has never stopped spewing propaganda. In fact, he proudly stands by the axes of evil fear-mongering he was pushing while working for the White House. Yes, from is considered relevant.